Welcome back to ESA TV. Today we are privileged to be joined by Honourable Mr Ted Bailey, um, former Premier of Victoria from 2010 to 2013. Um, prior to entering politics, Mr Bailey studied architecture in Melbourne University and throughout his public life has maintained keen interest in planning and encouraging growing economy. Uh, currently, Mr. Bellew serves as a patron to uh, Multicultural Arts Victoria and as a chair of Victorian Anzac uh, Centenary Committee. Mr. Bellew, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure. Prior to entering politics, you worked for Tourism Victoria and whilst in office, you ran an advertising campaign in China to attract the middle class um, to Victoria. In your view, how important is the role of tourism in the Victorian economy and how can we convince tourists who are short on time to skip Sydney and with its Opera House uh, for Melbourne? Easy to teach them how to skip Sydney, that's the easy part. But uh, we need to understand that China has a very special relationship, our biggest trading partner now, one of our neighbours largely in the same time zone, so it's a huge opportunity for Australia. And I was very proud to lead what was then the biggest trade delegation from anywhere in the world to China. Uh, and as a part of that, we sought to ensure that tourism was one of our competitive advantages, well it is one of our competitive advantages, but that it featured in our presentations. And we've got a tourism offering here, unlike anywhere in the world, because we've got something of everything. It's been a long-term commitment from a number of governments and I think it still presents us with an incredible opportunity. Uh, and Chinese have their own particular wants when they uh, travel. Uh, they may well enjoy a visit to the Sydney Opera House, but they enjoy even more a visit to uh, the uh, Sovereign Hill um, development and the Phillip Island and our coast and our extraordinary offering here in Melbourne. Uh, we should never underestimate it, and it's now one of our leading drivers of uh, international engagement. In addition to China, your government had a strong focus on building Australia-Indian relations. Um, with your efforts recognised by your receipt of the 2013 Ashoka Medal from uh, the Australian India Business Council of Victoria. How important is Australia's relationship with Asia, and specifically with India and China? with regards to our economic future and are we currently doing enough to foster these relationships? So trade engagement is probably the most significant thing we can do in Victoria in particular, but in Australia generally. We are a small nation, but we're in a critical part of the world. So our relationship with China is important. Our relationship with our region is important, be it Indonesia or Southeast Asia, but our relationship with uh, India in particular is going to grow over the next 30 years. And if you look at population growth that lies before us, uh, in uh, the next 30 years, by 2050, China will have reduced its population. Europe will be generally a little bit bigger, but just modest growth. The US will have modest growth. Africa will have enormous growth, hundreds of millions of extra people. But in the corridor to our immediate west, be it Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Bangladesh Indonesia, Sri Lanka, there's some 600 to 700 million extra people going to be there on our doorstep. So our relationship with India will be critical to our future. Uh, India, just in a few years time, will be the most populous nation on earth. We have so much in common in terms of history, uh, the way we're governed, and obviously in the region and language, there's an opportunity for us. China will remain because of its significant economy, but over future years our relationship with India would be just as critical. So we have to be more sophisticated uh, about the way we deal with India. We have to turn our relationship into meaningful trade engagement. And with any luck, we'll get a free trade agreement before too long with India. We have that uh, advantage now in China, but it's perhaps taken too long to get the Chinese one. New Zealand has got a head start on us there. We need to be much more upfront about it and we need to educate Australians about what is going to happen in the next 30 years. The world will change, our relationships will be important with the US, with UK, with Europe, but we have an enormous opportunity on our doorstep and that's what I've sought to uh, focus on 
in recent years and that's why we took uh, such a significant role with trade engagement be it to China, to India, to South Korea, to the Middle East. It's our region, it's our future and the opportunity is there. In recent years we've uh, seen several industries in Australia declining in activity and even going offshore with notable examples in the manufacturing and automotive industries. In your opinion, which industries should Australia be prioritising in order to boost long-term employment and economic growth? Because we're a small nation and we're at some distance from some of the world's major markets, we have to concentrate on what our competitive advantages is, or are and what they have been. If you look at the history of Victoria, our competitive advantages in the first instance post-settlement was gold. The discovery of gold shaped this city, shaped this state. And from then it became a building centre, one of the fastest growing places in the world. And we had agriculture uh, very much as one of our competitive advantages. In the early 20th century, we moved to manufacturing based on low cost energy, based on our uh, position in the transport network in Australia. Melbourne became such a critical focus and in fact, most uh, Australians don't remember, most Victorians don't remember that Melbourne was actually the capital of Australia from 1901 to 1927. That gave us a competitive advantage. Some of those competitive advantages we've lost. We had low cost energy, we are now one of the highest cost energy places in the world, which is an irony considering we have gas, oil, we have uh, coal reserves, we should have the lowest cost energy. That hasn't happened for a variety of reasons. We've lost that competitive advantage. We've lost, as a consequence, some of our manufacturing advantage. So what have we got now is what we have to concentrate on. And we do have the most livable city in the world, and that makes us a draw card. We have a very strong intellectual base, and our education system is as good as anywhere in the world. It can still be better, but it's as good as anywhere in the world. And we have a fantastic agricultural uh, base as well. We need to focus on those things, focus on our multicultural base, focus on our education offering, focus on our agricultural offering and maintain the leverage on our competitive advantages. They're not the only ones, but they're important to us and they'll be important for the future. And I still think we can recover, if we're smarter, we can recover a competitive advantage on low cost energy. But if we shut down our advantage, we will end up losers. Along a similar theme, in 2016 quarterly construction activity suffered its biggest fall in 16 years. One of the key factors behind this could be high construction costs. With the research paper this year analysing 13 major global cities and finding Melbourne's construction costs to be second only to New York's. Is our construction industry being stifled by high costs and how can we boost this industry over the next few decades? So I think this is one of the most important issues we faced. High, already high, and escalating costs of construction are having a huge impact on our nation, on our cities, and our economy. And it is extraordinary that uh, in this part of the world we could have construction costs which are already rated as the second highest in the world. And it has a variety of impacts. So you just take infrastructure. Australia suffers currently from a, an infrastructure deficit. Part of the problem with that is constructing new infrastructure is so costly that governments can't afford to do it. Now what governments have been doing in recent years is putting that cost off into future generations, taking it off the budget line and putting it onto the bills of future uh, electricity um, bill payers or water bill payers. That is a very fraught proposition. Net result is we don't have the infrastructure we should have. There's a second impact on our cities which is critical. High construction costs has meant that we're actually pricing families out of the homes that they would like to have. To think that a, a family can uh, pay enormous sum for a three bedroom home in a high, high rise or high density development in the inner, inner part of the city is one thing if they can afford it. But the second part of that story is they can buy twice as much area in terms of an, a home at half the cost in greenfield developments. So what are families doing? 
they're making a decision. It's too expensive for families to live in high density developments. They can buy twice the area, half the price in the greenfield. So the greenfield development is continuing. So the high and escalating cost of construction is actually having more to do with the shape of our cities than just about anything. And as a consequence, we, we've, we're creating a donut in our cities where families are being priced out of the core of our cities. Uh, I don't think there's uh, generally a, um, a movement against higher density development, but if you can't afford it, you won't live there. So we're building very small apartments, very small apartments, particularly in Melbourne, smaller than in Sydney, can't accommodate families and families are going to the fringes. That's an unsustainable proposition. And the way to deal with it is to address not the planning issues. You can make as many planning uh, constraints as you like and the planners love to dream about our cities. But families make the choice on what they can afford. So we have to make higher density development more affordable for families and we have to deal with this problem of high and escalating construction costs. So on two fronts, on infrastructure and on housing, these high costs are shaping our cities more than any planning policy. And that's potentially to our long-term detriment. And as some young people will, uh, were telling me just last week, all we're getting is dog boxes in the city we don't want to live in. And that's not good for families, not good for our future. What do you think are the sources of these high construction costs? Well, they're not what people think they uh, are necessarily. Yes, labour costs are high here, but it's all the conditions that come with those labour costs. But on top of that, we don't have effective competition in our constructive in construction industry. We have almost no international competition, and even internally, we don't have much competition. If you think about any tender in any major project, all the input costs, labour, materials, uh, are all pretty much fixed. We've got to deal with that. We've got to introduce more competition. We, uh, we have some areas in our construction industry where we have monopoly supply chains. That's madness. And we have this practice in government, which we sought to change, uh, where we announce in advance of a tender what the cost is going to be. And no one would do that with their home. And governments have to be much smarter the way uh, about the way they go about these things. So there's a range of issues which keep our costs high and probably the biggest problem is when it comes to all the decision makers and participants in that process, no one really cares. Who is it that is looking after those who will pay the bills, the payers in the future? Governments don't mind what it costs as long as they can get it funded. The banks don't mind as long as they're getting a percentage. The construction industry itself doesn't mind, they're getting a percentage. The consultants don't mind, they're getting a percentage. So there's no force at work to constrain construction costs in this country. And unless we do something about it, we will be at the top of the list soon. We, if, we're, if we're number two now, we'll be at the top of the list. And that makes investment problematic for anyone from overseas. So we've got competitive advantages, we have to nurture them and protect them. And we have to make sure that we don't price ourselves out of investment, infrastructure or the housing we need.